I was born and raised in Yonkers, New York. Um, I grew up in the projects where at a very er young age, I seen a lot of drug selling, a lot of drug use. My mom's worked very hard. She went to work every day. Um, I guess the pay wasn't enough because we was in a struggle. And as I continue to get older, we continue to be in a struggle. I continue to see the people in the streets winning. So I guess that's when I turned to the streets. I started selling drugs at the age of 15. I've been in and out of jail since the age of 17. In 2004, um, I had to do four years to 2008. That's when I decided to change my life, change my ways. When I came home, I looked for work like every day, but nobody would hire me. They either wouldn't call me back or they talk about my past, and as months went by, I started getting frustrated, started getting angry, I was feeling hurt, until a friend had reminded me about Graceland Bakery. So I, I went down, put my name on a list, afterwards I continued looking for work. I remember this day like it was yesterday. Um, I was riding around with a friend, and I got a call from Graceland Bakery asking me, do I want to work? And I said, absolutely. And I've been there ever since, February 2nd, 2015, make six years straight. I'm very proud of that. To me, it ain't all about the money. It's about being a man and doing the right thing. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm grateful for that. I achieved everything I set to accomplish. Um, I have three bank accounts. I have a beautiful three-year-old daughter. And my mom's called me about at least twice a week, let me know how proud she is of me. Um, I, I, I can't really explain the things Grayson done for me. It saved my life. If I was still in the streets, I'd be dead or in jail. It's hard to explain like with words, but it's just a great place. It does great things for everybody. When I help another person, it, it, it do something for me. It, it put a smile on my face. Just imagine if everybody walk around smiling, how much better life would be, you know? If you're willing to change your life, is there. 104 Alexander Street. <laughs> Thanks for having me in my company. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to um, answer them later on in the morning. Um, before I introduce the person I'm supposed to introduce, um, before I came to Grayston, my heart was like this big. Now my heart, eight years later, is like all the balls in this room together, and I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I'd like to introduce um, the leader of trying to make the open hiring model um, for all business across the world, um, a good friend of mine. Um, he got me striving for um, bigger and better things, just being in his presence. You know, um, I'm real grateful that God brought him into my life, um, CEO and President Mike Brady. I'm going to be breaking my rule I set uh, a couple years ago. I got to do a TED Talk with Dion. I said, never follow Dion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm so grateful to be working with him and our team members at Grayston, and really grateful. Is this a clicker? Let's... For the opportunity to uh, share the story here about Grayston and hopefully inspire and provoke others to think about different ways to do hiring and what's available to you. Um, I'm really grateful that we've given this platform to share our story. Um, I've got my notes here, because I don't want to make any mistakes after what Dion does. Um, so bear me, with me with that. Um, 
But the story of Greyston is pretty fascinating. And um, who's, who's heard of Greyston here? Okay, great. So there's a few people. What, what I'd love to do now is, is those of you that haven't heard of Greyston, you're going to get over, good overview. You saw what, what Dion talked about there. But I want to dive deeper into the topics today. I want to get into really reimagining capitalism. What could we do together as an organization? And recognizing where Greyston's been and where we're going to go in the future and how perhaps I can help you with your businesses. Um, there's a few different things around our efforts to scale, the impact we're, we're making at Grayston now, but we need to do it through systems change, and I need the collective efforts of everybody in this room to do that. And then I want to explore the topics of dignity of work and what that means. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about Grayston. Located like many cities, in a place where we struggle with poverty, the issues of criminal justice, systems, poor education systems, poor healthcare systems that haven't given people an opportunity to change. And lots of people know about the bakery, which is located here on the banks of the Hudson River in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Yonkers, one of the neighborhoods where Dion grew up. A lot of folks don't know, however, about our nonprofit organization that's just a few blocks away. And this is where we house our community service that includes our child care center. We've got 10 community gardens. And we've got four units of low-income housing, four buildings of low-income housing. This is the model that's allowed us to, to build a thriving social enterprise over the last 33 years. But I want to talk today about what we're going to do for the next five years together. For years, we've been thinking about how to build our impact in Yonkers, how to address the issues of poverty and move things forward. But now we're moving from this place-based model to a practice-based model, where what we've done and the, and the impact we have, we think we can scale at a larger level. And how do we make that happen? Well, it's the work of the team here. Um, and trying to get you to shake up the way you think about hiring, the way you think about the way you bring people into your organizations. Because certainly what I'm going to share with you today is going to raise a lot of questions which is nice because we have a practicum where Dion's going to be speaking some more. And uh, we'll, we'll take all your questions, and hopefully I'll address a lot of them now. Uh, but you need to think differently about the way you can bring people into your organization. Um, this is not new, but I'm really excited to share this idea with you because I know, without a doubt, if you try an inclusive hiring model or you work towards an inclusive hiring model, you'll create value within your organization. There's without a doubt, if you can examine the type of work you're doing to ensure you're giving opportunities to women and men, people of color, people of all races and religions, people of all faiths, people of every sexual orientation, people in every economic level within your community, immigrants and refugees, and certainly our returning citizens coming out of the criminal justice system. If you have a model like ours that takes all of those into consideration, you're going to create value in so many different ways in your organization. And I'd like to think you could do it through considering some of the things that we're doing at Grayston. And when we got invited to, to come here, I was just so excited because I know it's the folks in this room that appreciate that the power of business can do so much more. And it's the folks in the room that will take the risk to think about, all right, what does it mean to build an inclusive economy? And so while Dion is an amazing person, we've got 100 folks within Grayston Bakery that came through our doors and we're giving a chance, for, a chance to. What I'd like you to think about while I'm going through this is, is there a single job at your organization that perhaps in, in the past had kind of been overlooked is not one that's critical? but you could now apply a, an inclusive hiring model to and have it be the focal point of your social justice innovation program so that you can think about how you're, how you're going to move your organization towards and forwards that. And I want to go back just a little bit, and this is a nice segue into some of what Daniel was talking about, into our founding. This is a picture of Bernie Glassman. Bernie was a Buddhist monk. He started Grayston 35 years ago. Uh, he was well ahead of his time. 
understanding then that he could create a business that both made profits but also could contribute to the community. And his initial community was just the Zen students that he worked with. And it wasn't until he recognized the kind of success around his model and what he was trying to do that he became kind of the model for social enterprise and started doing our work that we did in Yonkers. And now today, we have this bakery and this saying. We don't hire people to bake brownies, we bake brownies to hire people. You know, when you have that kind of North Star, it allows you to think about ways and things in a certain way, and, it, and it's Bernie's spirit that's now driving our work forward. And it's his kind of contribution to open hiring and his spirits around non-judgment, uncertainty, and loving action, which are the, the basis of what we do. We're not concerned with what people have done in the past, I'm just concerned with what they're gonna do in the future. It's not doesn't mean I'm not concerned about how we perform. We've got to get brownies out the door every day. But it doesn't matter if you've done anything in your past as long as you're helping me to get those brownies out the door. And of course, every good entrepreneurial story needs a bit of good fortune. <laughs> and we had some serious good fortune. Uh, ben meant, excuse me, Bernie met Ben Cohen at one of the first Social Venture Network conferences. And these gentlemen shared a set of values that have allowed us to have a 25-year relationship with Ben and Jerry's in Grayston. So we moved from a small organization essentially making cakes and tarts, shipping them into New York City, to a global workforce, an organization making a tractor trailer of brownies a day. 35,000 brownies. 35,000 pounds of brownies. <laughs> That's what fits in a tractor trailer that Dion and his, and his team put together every day. So those go into chocolate fudge brownie and half-baked flavors. Anybody tried those? <laughs> so what's great about hearing a Grayston speech is now you really can eat the ice cream guilt-free. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you're kind of selfish if you don't. <laughs> so when you see it there, you got to grab it. Um, and this amazing brownie has given 3,500 opportunities to folks in Southwest Yonkers that may otherwise not have a job. It's put $65 million back into the economy of Southwest Yonkers in an economy that really needs it over the course of our history. And it's been good business, but as much as I love the story of the super brownie, it's really a story about people. It's the story of Raymond, Doreen, and William, that after having their cards stacked against them, growing up in a really tough community, trying to make their way, they're never given a chance to work. They're never given the opportunity for whatever might be the reason. And through Grayston, we've given them a chance, and of course, as you might expect, they're, they're terrific team members and, and terrific people to have on board. So what is open hiring? What am I talking about? pretty simple. At the same time, it's pretty radical. You come through the door of the bakery, put your name on the list, we take the next person off the list when there's a job available. No questions asked, no background checks, no reference checks, no interviews. We just give them a chance. Billions of dollars are spent on the process of trying to filter people out. What I'm trying to ask today is that you think about taking some of that money and spend it on investing and bringing people in and giving them a chance. But of course, when I talk about this model, people are like, you do what? <laughs> you just hire anybody? Like, what's the bakery like? <laughs> you know, what processes do you have in place <laughs> to handle this mayhem? <laughs> the honesty, honest situation is this is a facility that runs like any other manufacturing facility. But actually, it's, it's not true to say that because we run at, at a world-class level 
of food safety and food defense to deliver a product to some of the best known brands in the world. And we do it with what many people would consider unemployable. And the courageous leaders here, the HR managers here, understand it's, a, it's more than the job. It's making sure we're, we're overcoming the obstacles that are going to prevent team members from being successful. And so while we think about what it means to give someone an opportunity, we also think about the obstacles that people are going to come across. Because at the end of the day, I need to get brownies out the door. And if my team members aren't able to come to work, I'm not going to be able to deliver on what I'm trying to do. So, while the job's the first thing, and by all means, if you're ready to bring someone in, just bring them in. Just give someone a chance and, and do away with the mechanisms you think are trying to filter people out and try to make that person successful. The way we think about it is, of course, it's workforce development and training. But then what other benefits and services are people going to need? And a lot of this stuff is already available. It's already available in your organization and certainly available in your communities. Things around mental health services, child care, housing. These are the services that you need to make sure if someone has a problem and they ask you to help, you solve it for them. Once you've solved it for one person, you can solve it for the next person. It's not all that complicated. But you need to think and at least ask about it. And then the last piece is creating a culture that accepts people, removes the stigma, that says, hey, you come to work for me, we're going to make a try how this comes together. There's, there's no shame in anything you've done in your past, we're just going to move forward. And I like to talk particularly about childcare, uh, in that, you know, I like kids. I admit it, I'm sorry. I think they're, they're kind of cool, they're smaller versions of us. Uh, but too often, I don't know, we, we're kind of, it's an afterthought for our team members. But if these kids aren't being looked after, and I'm changing the schedule, which I have to do in the Northeast, snow, these things, breakdowns, everyone runs manufacturing, yeah, you've got to change the schedule, right? If there isn't proper early education in place in childcare to look after these children, it's going to be a burden on my team members, it's going to be a burden on my ability to help get the product out the door. All I need to do is ask. And in the meantime, now I'm helping these kids. Just because I like to get brownies out the door. Um, these are the kind of things we're, we're excited and anxious to work with. And share these ideas and make sure people are aware of what the process is. And Dion and his team know when they come through the door, we have a mutual understanding. I need you, and I'd like you to come to work. These are the rules by which we need you to perform. In turn, I'll do all I can to make you successful, but if you're not doing your part, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a program, it's a business. People are asked to leave, and there's plenty of people that are asked to leave. But we believe with each opportunity we give, it gives that person the chance to potentially be successful. And if they're successful at Grayston, that's great. If they're not, maybe they'll be successful at their next place. But with each day and each opportunity they come in to receive that training, we're making a difference. And that's where we believe the investment should be made, not in trying to filter out each different one that's going to be coming through the process. We're really hoping that this can be a model for the way businesses work in the 21st century, that we reconsider the way hiring works. Uh, I want to take a moment, though, and, and maybe look backwards at some things that have been similar, or at least movements we saw afoot. And since we're in Philadelphia, I put this up, but I'm not going to talk about what happened in Independence Hall. I want to talk on, about something that happened at 3600 Broad Street. This is Pastor Leon Sullivan. Uh, he was the pastor at the Zion Baptist Church. Uh, he's better known for being the first African-American uh, director at General Motors and for the creation of the Sullivan Principles. Sullivan Principles formed the basis of the work that G GM later did with uh, 100 other multinationals to boycott the work in South Africa until apartheid ended. Based on those principles, Kofi Annan, in 1999, took them and created the Global Sullivan Principles for Corporate Social Responsibility, which was one of the first times now that the UN took steps to, 
to encourage multinationals to think more about uh, social justice and the value of human. I love this quote, and I think it really reflects what we're hoping we can inspire people to think about today. And then we fast forward 15 years from that date, and we get to the global goals. So these were 17 goals talked about in September 2015 to inspire multinationals again. And I love the language that they had used, and I want to make sure I get it right. It's a call to action to protect the planet and ensure all people enjoy peace and prosperity. <laughs> that would be a great goal. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of value here and a lot of value that we think we can unlock. One of the statistics that came out of uh, the work that was done was from a censure that said 78% of CEOs believe that this value can be locked within the existing functions of their organization. So they don't have to do anything new outside of their regular business practices, but just reimagine what they could do with their business practices. And that's what I believe open hiring is about. Just think about your model now and all the money that's spent in there. Can you unlock, can you take some of that money out and apply it differently? And so open hiring, it's not gonna solve poverty. It's not gonna reduce the issues around gender equality. It's not gonna be the, the cure-all for issues relative to poor education, but we can contribute to it if we think more broadly about the issues I'm talking about today. One area where we know open hiring can have a huge impact is our issues of mass incarceration and recidivism. And when I, when I talk about it, lots of people go, you know, is that really my thing? Is that my business? And what I gotta say is, it's an $85 billion a year expense in the US. There's roughly 70 million folks that are, have a criminal record in the US, the same number uh, of people with a four-year college degree. One out of every two African-American men by the age of 23 will have a criminal record, and nearly 40% of white men. The same population of the United States in 1900, or everyone in 1900 would have had a criminal record if it's the same number as today. <laughs> Something needs to be done, and we believe that it's the business leaders here that can make a difference. But we're not going to necessarily encourage, this is, this is a, a, a movement to, to half the, the, the number of people incarcerated, led by an amazing leader, Glenn Martin, of Just Leadership. I encourage everybody to look it up. Uh, but as these people get out of the prison system, we're going to need to be the businesses that employ them. But I don't want to suggest that open hiring is, is all about social impact, because it's not. We've talked about it, it's good business. It's going to put your human capital team in the middle of your sustainability plan. The ROI, come to the practicum, we'll talk about it. If you're not spending on filtering people out, you're spending on investing people in. And you're attracting the type of millennial talent that you want to your organization because you're sending out the messages of yourself being a progressive organization. And it's only one job, two jobs, three jobs, 1% of your workforce. I believe this model is good business for us all. And we want to work towards moving it forward and I believe it's the people in this room that are going to help me to do that. I want to go back to the global goals in that the, the audaciousness of what they're trying to do, and they've set the goals up that by 2030, we're going to end extreme poverty, end inequality, and end climate change. We need to set those same goals for what we're trying to do in our communities. We need to set that same planning that says, hey, we can do this. We can make changes. We can make real impact. And we need to do it in our local communities, and, and, and we're going to do it as these business managers that control the jobs and things that we're up against. And I want to help contribute to that through what Grayson's going to be doing in the future. So while we've been looking at Yonkers and what we're trying to do, we're now launching what we're calling the Center for Open Hiring. This is where we can share the practices with you all in this room, where we can address the issues that you think might prevent you from trying this. We're going to have teacher sessions. We're going to deliver a toolkit of services. 
to help you overcome this. We're going to invite an employee swap so that Dion and his team members can go to your place, and I'd love to take your team members and let them experience what we're doing. We're going to have leadership team swaps so that I can bring your best and brightest to grace and help me solve my problems, and ideally I can give you some of my team members that can share what we do at Grayston to help you move your, your business planning forward. This is a picture of the location. This is what I'd like to say is our building. This is the campus we'll share together to try to address the issues around an inclusive economy so we can make the kind of differences that we want to, do, we, we want to work towards. You know, this is disruptive innovation. I don't want to suggest it isn't. We're, we're looking for those early adopters, for the people that want to take the steps, for those few cornerstone partners that want to, and want to believe that open hiring can make a real difference in their organizations to help us move this effort forward. And on the face of it, when you look at huge problems like this, there's obviously a lot that needs to get done and a lot of reasons to say, oh, it's to be someone else's issue. Someone else can do this, so this is not going to happen. Right? But like Nelson Mandela said, everything seems impossible until it's done. And I just want you to think about the one person that you might be able to bring into your organization that you could help to make a difference with. And before I close, we're going we're to get into one more topic, which is the dignity of work. Because I know everybody in this room is probably like me, and you're really passionate about your work. You love being able to get to work, do, have your impact, do what you can do. Turn that question around for a second and ask yourself, what would happen if you couldn't work? If there was no job available to you? Too many people in our economy that aren't able to have that opportunity, to have that passion, to go to work every day. And while all of us are thinking about how our businesses can make impact in this room, we often think about it through the products and services that we deliver. But it's amazing with every job we have that we have the power to change people's lives. That is an incredible contribution, the power of giving people a job. So I'd like you to think about how you can use that to make the kind of difference that you want to make in the world. We think a lot about this picture. Everybody is equal, equally deserving of a chance. But everyone doesn't need the same types of services. So having a model in place that addresses people that might need a little bit more of a hand up than someone else is exactly the kind of model that open hiring is. And it's exactly the kind of thinking we need to put in place to ensure we're lifting up everybody that, that needs an extra hand and then giving people just the right amount of support to be successful. I'm going to invite you all to, to join with us in this movement. I believe the time is now for our inclusive economy to happen. I believe the opportunity for reimagined capitalism is available. The forces of change are afoot that these opportunities can be successful. So I want to thank everyone again for allowing us to share the Grayston story, and I hope that we can talk more at the practicum afterwards. Thank you very much.